Good evening, brothers and sisters of the Remnant Church. I'd like to welcome you back to night number three of Out of the Cities, the Antitypical Exodus. This is, as was mentioned a second ago by Elder Mason, this is night number three. And the reason we're calling it Out of the Cities, the Antitypical Exodus is because uh, we know our forefathers, ancient Israel, were in bondage. And the Lord, in a miraculous way, released them, delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. And they took their exodus out of Egypt on their way to the promised land, the earthly Canaan. So we, as the antitypical or modern or spiritual Israel, also are asked or admonished to leave sin, which Egypt represents, or worldliness, and go to a better place, even in heavenly place, so to speak, on our journey to the heavenly Canaan. Amen. So that's the reason for it. The reason why we're doing these meetings this week, praise the Lord. I'd like you to do me a favor. I'd like you to all open your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms. Now, I have a question for you. When you're running a race, and I'm not advocating sports by any means, but when you're running a race, the most important part of that race is not necessarily how you end the race or the leg, second leg, third leg of the race or in, in the middle. But the most important part of a race is how you begin, how you start. And that's going to be the theme of tonight's meeting. Go with me to Psalms, and we're going to read from chapter 127, the 127th division of the book of Psalms. This is so important. This is our key text for tonight, Psalm 127. I trust you all have it, amen? And the Bible says... Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So, again, brother, sister, we can't overemphasize the point. Getting out of the city into the country is all based on the Lord leading you out. If he isn't in it, it will not be blessed. And we're going to see that tonight. Amen. Before we begin, let us all get on our knees, those that are able Let's entreat the Holy Spirit this evening. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you once again, Lord, for the opportunity to share your beautiful, wonderful truths from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy. We thank you so much, Lord, for this blessed, blessed truth and this message. And we pray, Father, that we would have you once again take full control of this meeting. If there are any demons here, we pray that you would send holy angels, mighty stealth angels from heaven at this moment to remove them, to evacuate this place, Lord. Make it a pure environment that we can study and share the truth in. Fill this place with angels. Fill the homes and the churches of all those that are watching, Lord, wherever they may be, with angels as well, to convict and convince the hearts of those who are and the valley of decision in terms of leaving the cities and moving to the country. We pray for all those that are hearing this message for the first time, that they also, Lord, that their touch would be heart, hearts would be touched and pricked by the information being brought forth. Please, Father, have your Holy Spirit and your angels minister to me word by word. Help me, Lord. Help me to deliver your message the way you want it to be presented. Flash light into my mind when necessary. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness, Lord. Use me as you see fit. I'm not worthy, Father, but I'm worthy through the merits of your son, Jesus. Cover me with his blood. Bless this meeting again, we ask, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was on the highway a few months ago here in Tennessee, and I was in a car, and the radio station was on a Christian radio station. And the radio station was playing a program called The Bible Answer Man. Any of you guys familiar with that? The Bible Answer Man. It's hosted by a man named Hank uh, Hennegraff, I believe is his name. Hank Hennegraff. And Mr. Hennegraff prides himself on being a man that can answer any question on any topic in the entire Bible, cover to cover. Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22 21. So this particular listener called in and he had a question. And he asked Mr. Hennegraff, he said, Sir, is the Genesis account of creation literal 
or symbolic or figurative? So Mr. Hinograf went on to answer, went through a long deliberation and explained it in a scientific manner and intellectualized this and intellectualized that and analyzed this, that, and the other. And his conclusion was that the week of creation was not literal, that it was figurative, it was symbolic. But what struck me was the answer, the response of the young man on the phone. He said, thank you, Mr. Hinograf, thank you, Bible Answer Man, I'm so glad that now I have the truth and I can share with my friends what the, real, the reality is about the Creation Week account in the Bible. Now that's scary. Let's go back to the Bible. We're going to stay in the book of Psalms. Turn back just a couple of chapters to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Again, laying a foundation for tonight's lesson. Psalm 118. Most of us are probably familiar with this text. Psalm 118 in verse 8. Psalm 118 in verse 8. Heavenly Father, please bless these words as we begin this important study tonight is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. That is the crux of the matter for tonight's study. Now, we can look at a couple of other texts. Just to reinforce Psalm 118.8, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. This is so key, brother, sister. We have to lay this down in the very beginning before we move into the lesson. Psalm, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, and we're going to begin at verse 5. Jeremiah 17 and verse 5. And the Bible declares, once again, thus saith the Lord, cursed, what? Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Now let's skip down to verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. So it's clear there, very clear. Verse 5 says, Cursed is the man that trusteth in man. Verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in who? In the Lord. In the Lord. So very clear. We are blessed when we put all of our faith, hope, and confidence, all of it, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Very important. So this is night number three by way of review. On Sunday night, the first night, we talked about the question why. Why do we need to leave the cities? And we studied and we came to the conclusion that the main emphasis in leaving the city is to develop the character of Jesus. The second, of course, uh, secondary reason was because we want to escape God's judgments. That is a factor. That is true. But the main reason, the primary reason we need to leave it's because we need to be in nature where God is more fully there, where we can be influenced by his spirit, where we can listen to him speak to us through nature, and we can begin to reestablish God's image in us, fulfilling the plan of redemption and plan of salvation. Amen. Last night, we talked about where we need to go. Where do we need to go when we leave the cities? And we established the fact that we need to move as far away from the big cities as possible, where we can have, Sister White says, elbow room where we can have isolation and be in a desolate place where we don't have interference from enemies or potential enemies. Because at some point in time in the future, we know once these laws begin to be passed, our neighbors are going to want to not to have picnics with us. They're going to want to destroy us, to kill us in the name of Christianity. So we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we need to move somewhere where we can have elbow room, where we're not uh, influenced by our neighbors, that they're not too close together with us, and we can establish little colonies or little uh, established little points of, of locations where other Adventists are also also uh, living. That's very important too. So tonight, key night tonight. I hate to say this. I really don't want to say it's the most important night. We're only in night number three. But I'll just say it's a very important part of this series tonight. Very important. Very, very important. We're going to study the question of how how do we leave the cities? How do we get there? How do we get out? Well, the answer may surprise you. It may be more simple than you think. The Ministry of Healing, page 103. Those who receive are to impart to others. So again, that's our mission. That's our charge. As a family who has left the city twice, who has a very unique experience in leaving the city, we believe that we've received a great blessing from the Lord and that we need to impart that and share that with as many people as possible. And I thank the Lord we have an opportunity to do that here on this channel 
not only tonight, but the rest of this week. It's been a great blessing. So we ask to give. We ask to give. Jesus never began one day, not one day, making plans for himself. Everything he did was for other people. So we're trying to, to fulfill that as far as being Christians is concerned as well. Amen? Amen. So question for you. What is faith? Now you're probably asking Brother Bridges, can it be that simple? Well, we're going to see, aren't we? Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, Hebrews chapter 11. The Hall of Faith. Hebrews 11. And we're going to begin at verse number 1. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Lord, please continue to bless your holy words. Please continue to be with us as we move step by step, word by word, scripture by scripture, verse, slide by slide into our study. We ask and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, faith, this is the definition from the Bible of the word faith. Biblical definition. What is faith? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. Now, do you want a country home? Yes or no? Well, we assume because you're watching the broadcast this evening, you do want to move to the country. Amen. So the substance is your country house. You can envision it in your mind. You can picture it. Maybe you're going through the Internet and seeing some things that may uh, excites you as far as potential homes go, but that is the substance. Substance meaning something tangible, something you can touch, right? That's the substance of, of the things that are hoped for, your country residence. The evidence is what? The evidence is in the Word of God, in the Word of God. Now, God makes several promises that we're going to look at in a minute that point to the fact that if we trust in Him, and I'm giving this as a personal testimony now, the Lord brought us out of the city through a miracle, so I'm very passionate about what we're sharing this evening. The Lord will put you where you need to be, where he needs you to be, if you exercise what? Faith. Faith. So this is the substance of things hoped for. This could be your home. This is, the, if you can look here, this is the house right here. That's a whole lot of land. But the Lord is able. Or he may just allot you just this little portion here, which is enough too. Plenty of trees for wood, etc., but the point is this, if you give it all to Jesus, we're going to see he's going to work a miracle on your behalf. He can do it. But the problem is, do we know how to exercise that faith? Well, Sister White comments on that. She says, there are those who find it hard to exercise faith, even though we may know what it is. And we read it in the text in Hebrews 11. They find it hard to exercise faith and they place themselves on the doubting side. These, these people who what? Who find it hard to exercise faith, they lose much because of their what? Their unbelief. So are you saying to us, Sister White, that if we don't exercise faith, we're unbelievers? We're doubters? That's the way I see it. That's the way I see it. Let's continue in Hebrews 11. Verse 2. For by it, faith, for by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the words were framed by the word of God, the world, excuse me, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You know, it's so easy for us to get into a car and drive on a freeway or over a bridge. Me being from California, I've driven over the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Bridge many, many, many times. It's way up in the air going from San Francisco to Oakland or even the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco to Marin County. And it takes faith to do that. But many times we put more faith in man than we do in God. We just assume because man built it and it's been there for 50, 60, or 70 years, it's not going to fall. It's going to stand. We need to put more faith in the Lord than we do in mankind. Verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Hmm. Five, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he did what? He pleased God. Now, let me ask you a question. How do we please God? How do we do that? What's well, in the very next verse, verse six. 
But without faith, it is what? It is impossible to please him. Oh, the Bible speaks so clearly, so clear. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is God, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if we want to be followers of Christ, we want to be Christians, we want to follow the Lord whithersoever he goeth, we want to please him in everything we do, we can't please him without what? Without faith. We can't do it. That's serious, brother, sister. Very, very, very serious. Verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, water or rain from the sky, right? Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now that's faith. The Lord tells you, build an ark, because evil is on man's heart continually. I'm going to destroy the world. So I'm going to present something to the world that's never happened. There's going to be some white, fluffy, little cotton-looking things in the air, and water is going to come down out of them. And that's what's going to help destroy the world, along with the spring, water springing up from the ground. Now, Noah had never seen that. No human being on earth had ever seen that. But Noah, by faith, moved in fear to build that ark because he believed what God told him. So the evidence was where? was in God's word. God spoke it, and it was so. So he believed it. Amen. So that's where we have to get. That's the point we have to get to. So question, open screen question, pop quiz again. What was the very first miracle that Jesus performed? Now, we all know it was changing the water into what? Into wine. We all know that story. That was a miracle, correct? Big miracle. He took ordinary water, just water, right? From a local stream and turned it into pure, mature wine of the what? The worst quality? The best quality. The best. Now, that's a miracle. We don't know how it happened. We don't know if it transitioned like this illustration here, slowly developed into the wine, or if it changed into wine instant, instantaneously. We don't know. But the bottom line is, brother, sister, Jesus did something that was miraculous. And he was able to take care of those people at that wedding, wedding party. Now, usually the story tells us in the Bible that people provide the best in the beginning, but Jesus provided the best at the end. And there's a lesson there too, but that's another study for another time, for another time. Amen. So, miracles, parting of the Red Sea, Exodus chapter 15, verse 1 and 8. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as in heap, and the depths were congealed, congealed in the heart of the sea. Now, we all know congealed basically means what? Frozen, frozen. Now, we can't in our minds picture that, but that's essentially what the Lord did with the water when he parted that, that Red Sea, the Sea of Reeds. That was a miracle. That's one. Here's another one, Joshua 10. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley, valley of Agilon. And the sun did what? Stood still. And the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Can you say amen? Amen. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. That's ancient Israel. Who's modern Israel? Is the Lord going to fight for us in this, these last days? Absolutely. So will he listen to the voice of a man in these last days? Absolutely. But there's, a, there's a, a, a principle here. It has to be by, according to Hebrews 11, there has to be some faith involved. He's not going to exercise a miracle if there's no faith because he's not pleased. Do you get the lesson? Amen. Let's look at another one. Isaiah 38. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. We all know the story. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order. For thou shalt die and not live, and this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees 
which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees, which by degrees, or which, by which degree, excuse me, it was gone down. That comes out to about 40 minutes. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the sun actually stand still? Or did the, the earth actually stop rotating? Now, this is very, very interesting, brother, sister, because there's much more to this miracle than, than meets the eye, really. I mean, just think about how much God had to do to cause, to keep from total chaos and disruption taking place on the earth. The other planets, the moon, the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, gravitational pull, all these factors he had to contend with. And he was able to do it without anybody on earth even noticing. The only one that people that noticed were those that noticed that the sun went backwards, 10 degrees, 40 minutes. It didn't, it didn't move. So that, again, was an awesome miracle. Can God do miracles like that today? I am the Lord thy God, I change not. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever, forever, amen. So, I love this quote. I love it. The Bible says, she says, Sister White says, First Selected Message is 187, paragraph 2. We are in continual danger of getting above the simplicity of the gospel. I agree with that. We have all these great truths, the great cleaver of truths, of truth, the three angels' messages, the most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortal human beings, ever. But sometimes I think we take them a little bit for granted. A little bit for granted. There is an intense desire on the part of many to startle the world with something original that shall lift the people into a state of spiritual ecstasy and change the present order of experience. And we have that with fanaticism, don't we? We do have that. There is certainly great need of a change in the present order of experience, she says, for the sacredness of present truth is not realized as it should be. But the change we need is a change of what? Heart. We talked about that on Sunday night. And can only be obtained by seeking God individually for his blessing, by pleading with him for his power, by fervently praying, oh, we need prayer, that his grace may come upon us and that our what? Our characters may be transformed. And I love the background here. That's what we need to have total transformation of character. A country environment. Country environment. Let's go to the Bible. Let's get above, let's not get above the simplicity of the work. Let's go to the Word of God and break it down and keep it simple. Let's have a little Bible study. Amen. 1 John chapter 5. Let's go to the book of 1 John chapter 5. Again, just laying a foundation. We're doing very good on time. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 5, beginning at first, verse 13. Verse 13. We all there, amen? 1 John chapter 5. Lord, please continue to give us a blessing with each word that we read from your holy Bible. They are words of truth, life, and they are living words. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray and ask, amen. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he what? He heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe the word? Is it in the word? We have to believe. By faith, we believe that this is true. That is true. Amen. Let's go to the book of John, the gospel of John. John chapter 14. Again, just laying a foundation. We're going to get in a few minutes, a little bit into the practicum tonight. But we're going to start off with the spiritual. Amen. John 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, starting at verse 12. Verse 12. John 14 and verse 12. Jesus himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I what? Do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Do you believe it? 
Do you believe it is the question? Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Book of Matthew chapter 7 again. Just a simple little Bible study. Matthew 7. Not getting above the simplicity of the gospel. Amen. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to pick it up at verse 7. Matthew 7 and verse 7. We all there, amen? Amen. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone, that's you and I, everyone within the sound of my voice, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts to them that ask him? Are you asking for that country house tonight? In faith? Are you? Well, there are some conditions, and we're going to look at those conditions. Let's go to the, chapter, the book of James first, though. James chapter 4. This is very, very important, brother, sister. Very important. James chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse 1. James 4 and verse 1. Lord, please continue to bless these words. Give us a lesson tonight, Lord, for the rest of the week, the rest of the month, throughout eternity, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. James 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not. Why? Because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask how? Amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. So number one, verse two tells, teaches us that we're not asking, but when we do ask, according to verse three, we're asking the wrong way. We're asking amiss. What does that word amiss mean? From the Bible concordance, Strong's word number 2556, the transliteration, it actually means miserable to be ill, improperly, wrongly, to speak ill of, revile. So all those are definitions or descriptions of this word amiss. Is that how our prayers are being uh, brought up to the throne of God? Because we're asking the wrong way? Maybe there's some elements of our prayers that need to be considered tonight or looked at. The root word, kakos, pronounced kakos, of a bad nature, not such as it ought to be, of a mode of thinking, feeling, acting, base, wrong, and wicked, troublesome, injurious, pernicious, destructive, baneful. Is that how our prayers are to God? That's what the verse says. We don't ask, but when we do ask, this is how our prayers are from God's point of view. Very serious. So what should our spiritual condition be as we approach the throne of grace? We're talking about asking God to move us out of the city, into the country. But we can't just say, Lord, I want a country house and just sit back and just wait. Or be walking down the street and a country home is going to just fall out of the sky and, and fall on top of us. It's not that simple. It's going to take exercising some what? Some faith. Here we go. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? Not hear me. Hmm. That's very important. Very important. Proverbs 28, 9. We all know the verse. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law... Even his prayer shall be what? Abomination. You mean if I don't listen to the word of God, if I don't listen to God speak to me, if I don't go to church, if I don't study the Bible, my prayer is an abomination? Hmm. Strong language. Strong language. Let's continue. Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his what? His delight. But you have to be upright for it to be his delight. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. God regards righteous people with the ut to the utmost degree, the utmost level. Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. He heareth the prayer of the righteous. He listens. He hearkens. Psalm 34, 17. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth 
and delivereth them out of all their troubles. How many? All. So when we cry, if we're righteous, he hears us. He hears us. That's a blessing. 1 John 3.22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because why? We keep his commandments. Mm. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Again, pleasing. How do we please God? Through what? Faith. Faith. Exercising faith. Now, this is very serious too. Testimony volume 2, page 146 says, Fasting and prayer will accomplish how much? Nothing. While the heart is estranged from God by a what? A wrong course of action. So if I'm holding on to some cherished sin that I know is a sin, Fasting and praying will do nothing. I have to get the sin out by faith, asking God to remove it from me. Serious, brother, sister. Now, I want to read this. This is from Councils on Diet and Food. This is about health. This is not about health tonight. We're talking about country living, but there's a principle I want to look at here. I think it's very important. A principle. She says, I saw that the reason why God did not hear the prayers of his servants for the sick among us more fully, more fully was that he could not be glorified in so doing while they were violating the laws of health. Did you get the lesson? What a principle. And I also saw that he designed the Health Reform and Health Institute to prepare the way for the prayer of faith to be what? Fully answered. So you mean to tell me, prophet, you're saying that God does hear my prayer if I'm sick. If I'm afflicted, he hears it, but he would hear it more fully if I wasn't violating the laws of health. That's a principle, and it's very serious. This is another principle regarding prayer. Healthful living, 237. We should first find out if the sick one has been withholding tithes or has made trouble in the church. Uh-oh. Another principle. Very serious. Very serious. Just something to consider. Genesis 18, 19, for I know him, Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So the Lord said, I know him, I can trust him, I can depend on him to keep my ways and do my will. Does God feel that way about us? I wonder, I wonder. Psalm 24, 4, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Clean hands and a pure heart. Blameless, in other words, blameless, blameless. James 4, 8 corroborates with that verse, with Psalm 24, 4. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, Ye double-minded. So we have a lot of work to do, don't we? If we want the Lord to answer our prayers, we have a lot of work to do for ourselves. Severe self-examination. Severe, Sister White says. So once our heart is right with God, what do we do next? What's next? 2 Kings 19, 14 and 15. Again, just principles in terms of exercising faith and coming to God in prayer regarding leaving the city. These are very important. And Hezekiah, we all know the story, Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He was very concerned. Remember that letter? Telling him that, that uh, Sennacherib was on his way down. He had just conquered the ten tribes up north. So he felt like he'd come down to the south to Judah and Benjamin. It's just two tribes. I can conquer them easy, right? Basically is what he's saying. So Hezekiah panicked. He's like, no, no, I have to go to the Lord now. So he spread it before the Lord. Is that okay to do? My wife and I, what we used to do, we take our laptop, this one right here, and we would open it up and put it on our bedroom floor. And we would lay prostrate before it and we would beg God about, we'd put the picture up of the house that the Lord was working on our behalf for. And we'd, we'd pray and we'd beg and we'd say, Lord, please, you know how bad we want to leave. You know our hearts. We want to get out of the city as fast as possible. And we would tell him, if, if this is of Satan, close the door, shut it. Shut it tight. Every time we prayed that prayer, the, the door opened up wider and wider. Every time. But we showed the Lord we meant business. 
And when you do that, the Lord's arm will move on your behalf. We witnessed it. We witnessed it firsthand. And we're going to talk about it on Sabbath. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. So again, a, a praying principle in the Bible. Spread it before the Lord, then you acknowledge who he is and what he's done. The Lord loves that. And many of the people in the Bible that prayed to God that way were greatly blessed. Daniel, for example, acknowledge who he is, acknowledge what he's done, bring your supplication to him. The Lord loves that. He loves it. Praise his name. Signs of the Times, April 25th, 1892. The prayer of Moses was heard and answered. And we also may present our earnest petitions to God and receive of his grace and power. Watch this. This is the lesson. Tell the Lord what? Exactly what you want in the way of spiritual blessings. And you need not fear to lay before him your temporal needs and perplexity. perplexity excuse me. Lay them out. He, even though he knows what they are anyway, he wants you to go through the motion of doing it. Right? Exercise that faith. Make an effort, in other words. Make an effort. But again, here, don't vacillate between this, that, and the other. Tell them exactly what you need, what you want. That's what he wants you to do. Amen. Learn to pray short and right to the point, asking for just what you need. Let us learn to pray intelligently, expressing our requests with clearness and precision. Oh, Lord, well, I'm, I think, well, I don't really want to bother you, but I know you're busy. Uh, does the Lord want you to pray that way? No. Precise, clear, asking just what you need. Lord, we need to leave the city. The city is destroying our family. I need to get to the country so you can fix my character so I can help others do the same thing. That's the prayer. That's the prayer. Amen. Short and sweet to the point. Amen. Another principle. Review and Herald, July 6, 1905. Get together in companies of what? Two or three. That's biblical, right? It's in the Bible. And go off into some quiet place to seek the Lord. His promise, his promise, his promise is that where two or three are agreed together as touching anything, Bible says in heaven or in earth, their prayer will be what? Answered. Answered. So the more the better with the Lord. The more the better. Amen. Again, just to highlight the points. Number one, get together in companies of two or three. Two or three people, two or three families, two or three homes. Amen. Two, go off into some quiet place. That's always helpful. The country is always the best. Amen. Three, seek the Lord. Again, his promise is that where two or three agreed together as touching anything. Four, key point here, their prayer will be answered. It'll be answered. And God will answer it more times than not, we're told, in a way that we do not expect, that we don't expect. He has, he says, we have a, he has a thousand different ways to answer our prayers that we know nothing of, that we can't even imagine in our minds, right? Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. Why? They are in too great haste. Hmm. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. I remember at, at a camp meeting, maybe two years ago, I remember Brother Marcus did a, a Sabbath school, and he said, he made an awesome comment. It really struck me. He said, imagine telling God, I'll get back with you later. I mean, that's what we're really doing when we do this, when we're in a hurry, in a rush. Lord, I know you created everything. You framed the worlds. I'll get back to you when I have some time. The nerve of us, the nerve of us. She says, with hurried steps, they pressed through the circle of Christ's loving presence. I just read that. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. Too busy. Too busy. With their burdens, they return to their work. So instead of casting our burdens at whose feet? The feet of Christ. We still actually have them because we haven't taken the time to give them to him. And then to have intercourse or interaction or relation with him. We haven't had time to do that. We're rushing to get to work or wherever, whatever we have to do. Jesus has to come first. He has to come first. Amen. Great Controversy 621. Those who are unwilling to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for his blessing will not obtain it. 
wrestling with God. How few, how few know what it is? Exclamation point there. How few have ever had their souls drawn out after God with intensity of desire until every power is on the stretch? On the stretch. Real prayer. When these judgments start coming on these cities, there's going to be some praying. There's going to be, but we need to be doing it right now. Not waiting for then, right now. Right now. My Life Today, page 16. If you will find voice in time to pray, God will find time and voice to answer. He will answer one way or another. But there's some conditions, aren't there? We read them all earlier. We have to clean our, our hands and our hearts. So Hebrews 11:27. By faith he forsook Egypt. Who are we talking about there? Moses. Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Now how do you see that? How do you see somebody who's not there? Through faith. Through faith. Amen. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. So faith in the word. How do we know who we're serving? I was having a conversation with a sister today, witnessing to this sister, who told me she goes to church, but she never reads the Bible. I don't read it. I just go to church. I say, well, how are you going to know who you serve if you don't read who he is? I can tell you everything about Southern California, Beverly Hills, Hollywood, all these things. But unless you've actually visited there, you'll never have a feel for the town and how it really is. The same with the Bible. You can hear about Jesus, but you don't know him unless you read the living word. It's a transcript of what? His character. It's a blueprint of who he is. So you have to read it to understand who you're serving and who actually died for you and why he died for you. How do you know? Trust not in man. Trust not in man. So this picture has always intrigued me. And... I want to ask you, I know you're not able to respond on the channel, but I get different responses when I ask people about this picture. Some people say it reminds them of poverty, yes. They're obviously in a a cave. They don't have much, right? There is basically no ceiling. It's dilapidated. The students, some have uniforms, some don't. Some are in chairs, some are sitting, looks like, on rocks, it appears. The teacher seems to be enjoying what he's doing. He's teaching, and they're students, so they're learning, right? So, again, they don't have much there, but the purpose is being fulfilled. The teacher's doing his job, the students are doing their jobs, and they don't have hardly anything at all, but it's being taken care of. It's being fulfilled. So my point is, and the point of this photo is that maybe we think we need more things in this world than we really do, than we really do. Some people think they are bound for the kingdom when actually they're bound what? To this world. To this world. Self-seeking here. Pleasure and treasure of this world. Can't get away. I know a sister, and she's probably watching, Southern California, who owns two properties, two homes. We did a lot of talking over the last year or so. She was holding on. Holding on. She didn't want, she wanted to go to the country, but, well, I got this house and that house and She's finally taking the step to, to go ahead and try to sell the homes and move to the country. And I say amen. But it's, it's difficult. People have these, these things and they want to just, they want to hold on. They want to let go. I'm going to read from Testimonies, Volume 1. For those of you taking notes, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 1. I'm going to start at page 174. 174. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1. Let's go to James first, James chapter 5. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We should be right there, actually, already, because we were at James 4 a minute ago. Everybody there, amen? Amen. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for when? For the last days, the days that we're living in right now. Now, she comments strongly on this. Testimonies, volume one, page 174. She says, I was directed. Who directed her? God did. Amen. I was directed to James 5, 1 through 3. I saw that these fearful words apply particularly to
to the wealthy who profess to believe the present truth. Hmm. The Lord calls them to use their means to advance his cause. Opportunities are presented to them, but they shut their eyes to the wants of the cause and cling fast to their earthly treasure. Their love for the world is greater than their love for the truth. Their love for their fellow men or their love for God. He calls for their substance, but they selfishly, covetously retain what they have. They give a little now and then to ease their conscience, but have not overcome their love for this world. Love for this world. They do not sacrifice for God. The Lord has raised up others that prize eternal life and that can feel and realize something of the value of the soul. And they have freely bestowed their means to advance the cause of God. The work is closing. Yes, it is. And soon the means of those who have kept their riches, their large farms, their cattle, etc. We can turn that in 2015 language to houses and homes and condos and Mercedes and those types of things will not be wanted. I saw the Lord turn to such in anger, in anger, in wrath. And repeat these words, go to now, ye rich men. Serious. He has called, but you would not hear. Love of this world has drowned his voice. Now he has no use for you and lets you go, bidding you, go to now, ye rich men. A little bit more. Oh, I saw it was an awful thing to be thus forsaken by the Lord. A fearful thing to hold on to a perishable substance here, when he has said that if we will sell and give alms, we can lay up treasure in heaven. I was shown that as the work is closing up and the truth is going forth in mighty power, these rich men will bring their means and lay it at the feet of the servants of God, begging them to accept it. The answer from the servants of God will be, go to now, ye rich men. Your means is not needed. Ye withheld it when ye could do good with it in advancing the cause of God. The needy have suffered. They have not been blessed by your means. God will not accept your riches now. Go to now, ye rich men. That's very serious. Now, there's a principle there. Wanting to hold on to things and not sacrifice, just even in terms of leaving the city and getting to a country home. You can sell a home in the city and buy five different country houses, depending on what city you live in, of course. California, the homes are worth a lot more money out there, a lot more money. The real estate is high. New York as well. A few other states too. I'm going to go to one more vision she had that's very appropriate and very applicable. It's Testimonies, Volume 1 again, page 28. Page 28. I love this vision. Lord, please bless these words that you inspired, that you gave through the vision you gave your prophet, Sister White. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Soon after this, I heard, a, no, had another dream. I seem to be sitting in abject despair with my face in my hands, reflecting like this. If Jesus were upon earth, I would go to him, throw myself at his feet, and tell him all my sufferings. He would not turn away from me. Can you say amen? Amen. He would have mercy upon me, and I would love and serve him always. Watch this. Just then the door opened, and a person of beautiful form and confidence entered. He looked upon me pitifully and said, Do you wish to see Jesus? He is here, and you can see him if you desire it. Take everything you possess and follow me. So take how much? Everything you have and follow me. Everything. How many of us are willing to do that? Good question. I heard this, she says, with unspeakable joy, and gladly, gladly gathered up all my little possessions, every treasured trinket, and followed my guide. He led me to a steep and apparently frail stairway. As I commenced to ascend the steps, he cautioned me to keep my eyes fixed upward, lest I should grow dizzy and fall. We're doing good on time. Praise God. Many others who were climbing the steep ascent fell before gaining the top. Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. Finally, we reached the last step and stood before a door. Here, my guide directed me to leave all the things I had brought with me. I reluctantly laid them down. No, brother, sister. She says, I cheerfully laid them down. He then opened the door and bade me enter. So first she cheerfully, well, first she laid them down. 
How? Cheerfully. Then he opened the door. After what? She cheerfully laid down all her belongings. Then he opened the door and bade me enter. In a moment I stood before Jesus. Oh, what a lesson. What a lesson. So the point is this. She wasn't able to see the king in his glory and his beauty until she did what? Let it all, was willing to sacrifice it. Willing to let go. Willing to let it go. What a lesson. Beautiful lesson. Now, the members of the church should individually hold themselves and all their possessions upon the altar of God. That's an admonition from God. Testimonies, volume 5, page 465. We have to do that. God will bless us. And again, mentioning the tithe paying in the, in the uh, uh, slide before, a couple of slides earlier, that's so important. Many of our church members don't pay tithe. They don't do it. It is better to have 90% or 80% or 70% or whatever it is of your income blessed than have 100% cursed. And that's a fact. That's a biblical fact. I'm going to go with the king. So country living, page six, continuing. I could not sleep past two o'clock this morning. Something woke her up. Let's see what it was. She says, during the night season, I was in council. I was pleading with some families to avail themselves of God's appointed means, God's appointed means, amen, and get away from the cities to save their children. So we know, and we're going to see this in a little while, that if you ask God what to sell, when to sell it, he'll tell you. Those are his appointed means. To save who? Their children. Some were what? Loitering, making no determined efforts. So this is something that she saw. This is a fact that's taking place right now. She saw in vision, in a dream, in the future. That's what families were doing. They weren't making any effort at all. None. Let me skip these. So isn't that beautiful? Nice. Looks like a little uh, greenhouse there and got a garden over here. Looks like they're doing some remodeling here. This is where we need to be, saints, right here in the beauty of nature. John 15, 5. Again, another promise. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. So we can do everything with him. That's how I read that, right? Everything. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee where? Whithersoever thou goest. What a promise to know God is with you everywhere you go. If we're faithful, if we're pleasing him through what? Through faith. Through faith. Joshua 1, 9. Isaiah 8, 9 and 10. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces and give ear. All ye of far countries. We have met many people in far countries watching tonight. Amen. Gird yourselves and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. Speak the word and it shall not stand. For God is with who? With us. So some, this is a prophecy. So somebody is saying that no matter what the wicked try to do together against us, it's okay because we have God with us. Can you say amen? Amen. What shall we then say to these things? Another promise, Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Nobody. Hebrews 3, 4. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is what? Is God. Is God. So man may build the house, but who supplies the materials? God does. Amen. So where is the sacrifice? We know the story of Genesis 22. She says, I was cited the case of Abraham. God said to him, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Here's the lesson. Abraham obeyed God. He did what he said. He did not consult his feelings, but with a noble faith, noble faith and confidence in God, he prepared for his journey. So he didn't hesitate. God said, do this. He went and he did it, just like Noah and many others in the Bible. Abraham suffered, yet he did not let his will rise in rebellion against the will of God. Duty, stern duty, controlled him. He dared not consult his feelings or yield to them for one moment. When you hesitate, the devil comes in. 
You have to move and move quickly by faith. By faith. So, cooperating with heaven. Some more Bible verses. Again, it's heaven and us together. Working together. Curse ye Mirah, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly in the inhabitants thereof. Because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Does God need our help? Yes. He doesn't necessarily need it per se, but he wants our help. It's a cooperative effort, right? Divinity and what? Humanity. Humanity. Judges 5. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. Is that a beautiful promise? He's going to hold our right hand. Listen to this. Saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. Isaiah 41. Do we have the Lord's help? According to this verse, yes, we do. These are great promises, brother, sister. Wonderful, beautiful promises. We have to claim. We have to claim. Parents can secure small homes in the country with land for cultivation where they can have orchards And where they can raise vegetables and small fruits to take the place of flesh meat, amen, which is so corrupting to the lifeblood coursing through the veins. That's a promise too. On such places, the children will not be surrounded with the corrupting influences of city life. God will help his people to find such homes outside of the cities. Did you get the lesson? Let's repeat it. God will help his people to find such homes outside of the cities. He will help you. He helped us. He has helped many families. He will help you too. Praise his name. Let every man be wide awake for himself, country living, page 7, and try to save his family. Let him gird himself for the work. Watch this. God will reveal from point to point what to do when. Next. Do we have God's help, yes or no? Absolutely, yes. He wants to help us. He wants us out of this city. Are we cooperating with the Father? That's the question. That's the question. God helps those only who what? Help themselves. Help themselves. Mm. Sketch this from the life of Paul, page 267, paragraph 1. Only who help themselves. So in other words, what she's saying? She's saying what? Faith without works is what? It's dead. You have to have faith, yes, but you have to have Some works. It takes a combination of heaven and earth, heaven and humanity. Praise his name. So again, with our situation, we were praying, constantly praying. Let me give you a little advice, a little admonition from experience regarding the works part. You might want to start saving some money. You might want to start saving a little money. Let me give you a tangible example. This is part of our testimony. Last year, July last year, let me go back a couple of months before that. Brother Jeremiah Davis was speaking in Southern California. This is maybe May, April. And his wife, Aretha, gave the, offered the children's story at this church. It was the Fontana Church. She's given the children's story. And at the, toward the end of the children's story, she kind of goes off on a little tangent. I believe it was the Holy Spirit. It was Providence. She goes off on a little tangent. She starts out of, it wasn't even related really to the story. She starts talking about their move to the country, just out of the blue. They they moved out on faith. They packed all their boxes. They they packed everything up. They were living out of boxes, this and that, and the Lord moved. And we sat there and we heard that. So we said, and we knew, we knew, we were aware of the principle, but we just weren't really exercising it. Are you with me? So we, after that meeting, that night, we said, you know what? We need to move out on faith more. We were doing things, but not all the way doing things, all the way, all the way, right? And other families decided to do the same thing. So we decided to pack everything up, everything, put it all in a U-Haul, put my little Camry on the back, on a carrier, drove it to Tennessee. This is July, mid-July last year. Drove it to Tennessee put it all in storage, and then drove back to California by myself. Faith. Now, as soon as we did, and we did something before that, as a matter of fact, before we, I even made that move. We had an SUV, my wife's, my wife's beloved SUV. We sold that. We put that. I'm, getting, I'm just giving you some tangible works. Tangible. I'm trying to be transparent and private at the same time. 
put her SUV on Craigslist, asked the Lord to sell it. The Lord sold it the very next day for the price we wanted, cash, cash. Now you tell me, when you start to move in faith, God's arm will move. He's, it's like he said, okay, okay, brother and sister Bridges, I, I, I see now you're serious, so now I'm going to get serious. You're moving your arm, I'm going to move my arm now on your behalf. I'm going to start working my purposes out to get you out of the city because now I see you really mean business. You really mean business. So a month later, the, 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 uh, actually not even a whole month, a few weeks later after I bought everything in Tennessee and put it in stores, we lived off of paper plates and paper cups and had nothing. A chair here, a chair, no furniture. We said, this is it, Lord. We're going all the way, all the way. A couple of weeks later at the upper room camp meeting in 2014, the brothers here right now, Brother Parks, brought it to our attention that there was a house available somewhere in Tennessee, which I won't mention. So out of, out of respect. So again, the Lord began to move. He began to move. Praise his name. So we have to have faith, yes, but we have to also have some works or the faith is what? It's dead, according to the Bible. So you ready to go shopping? Amen. Praise God. Our people should be looking for opportunities to purchase properties where? Away from the cities on which are buildings already erected and orchards already in bearing. Now, that's not always going to be the case. You have like a checklist. Maybe 10 things that you want to have that are really necessary that you need. If you have 8 out of 10 and maybe that's not there, you're doing well, but it all depends on what's important as far as level of priority. Many people are buying property that doesn't have any trees. They're planting their trees when they get there. Or they're starting a garden when they get there. Or starting an orchard when they get there. Many people do it that way. These are some important points to consider. Very important. And these are just a few. How many acres do you need? Hmm. What is the nearest town? What is the, po is the population of that town? How far away is the nearest town? Those are things you have to really think about when you're shopping. How far away is the nearest large city of 100,000 plus people so you can go shopping and buy the things you really need? Is it an hour away, two hours away? What is the population density of the county you live, you're looking at, of the county? We talked about population density yesterday, last night. What is the average precipitation in the county? Can you grow food with no water, yes or no? No, you have to have water. What is the annual snowfall in the county in terms of your vegetation in the winter, maybe? What's the average high and low temperatures in January and July? How many growing seasons are there and how long? How far to county maintain road? Shared driveway or easement? You don't want that. You want to be very careful not to have a situation where, and you see a lot of things on the Internet, you might see a property you like, and it turns out that the driveway is being shared, maybe shared with somebody who's an unbeliever. Might not be a good scenario. We have to consider these things. Is there landline telephone service, hmm. cell phone service, internet? And those of us in ministry, we need to have these things are very important. At some point in time, though, we do need to what? Cut these things off at some point in the future. We'll get into that on Friday. Is there 911, 911 service uh, in the area operating? 911, 911. Is there a subdivision? You don't want to live in a subdivision. Any zoning laws, right? There are things that you can't do in California that you can do in a lot of other states. Building or st uh, does the state require building permits? Who owns the water, timber, and mineral rights? Some states you can actually build anything you want and not have to go to the authorities for permission. California, you have to get permission for everything. Everything, you have to ask permission, get permits for this, permits for that. Some states you can't even capture rainwater and use it. Water out of the sky from God you have to get permits to use or not be able to use it at all. It's against the law. Against the law. Pretty soon it'll be air. Does the property have a clean title? That's important. Is surface water present on the property? Does fruit grow in the area? What kind? How, how close is the nearest neighbor? Very important as well. Very important. So we talked about this yesterday. Just going to do a quick review. Our first property, our first country home in, in Tennessee too close to the neighbors, too close to all these, all the neighbors are too close. 
This side was good. It was about four acres. This was all open. Not so good here. Driveways too close. Mailboxes. Everything was just too close. It wasn't a good situation. It felt good being out of the city. And this was the country. This was a town of about 1,200 people. Very small. No sidewalks. No stores. No uh, signal lights. There was uh, one gas station and a little you know, country store in the gas station and one post office. And that was it. So it was the country, but we just were in a place that wasn't quite so secluded or isolated. Needed to have more elbow room, as Sister White says, right? So here are some websites that we used to look at almost every day. And when I tell you it was a job, looking for a home is a job. And it's a full-time job. So Zillow was a very popular one, very much so. Realtor.com is a good one. And you'll also find... And you can find all these online yourself. I'm just giving these as examples. I'm letting you know our experience. A lot of these might have some information on them that others don't. For instance, maybe Zillow won't have the acreage where Realtor.com will. So just little things like that, little you know, differences in the information that each website provides. This is a very popular company, too. It's not pronounced cry leaky or cry likey. It's actually pronounced cry like, like cry like a baby. And they're very popular, and they're very good with country property as well. Cry Like is a good one. And again, they have information a lot of times that the other, like, the, for instance, the water source. <clears throat> Many times Zillow won't have the water source. Is, is it public? Is it county? Is it city? Is it well water? They won't have that. But Cry Like usually does have that on their website. This is Trulia. Trulia is a pretty good one, too. We use that a lot when we're looking around. Remax is another one. Very popular. We use that one as well. In fact, our first realtor worked with Remax. The first realtor we had, uh, the only realtor actually, because there was no realtor with our, with our second go around. It was for sale by owner, which is a good situation to be in as well. Hotpads.com. Never used them. I've heard some good things about it. Hotpads.com. eBay. Now, don't laugh. I've been hearing some good things about eBay. Very good things. eBay sells real estate. They sell homes. You'd be surprised. Craigslist, again, don't laugh. Craigslist sells houses. You can find some great deals on Craigslist. Country deals, too. Absolutely, craigslist.com. Look up your state, your area, the closest city or, or, or suburb or whatever. And usually they have the people that are selling homes in outlying areas put their ads in the, in the cities closest to them. They do that. ZipRealty.com is another one. ZipRealty. Homes.com, very popular one. Homes.com. HUDHomes.com. Now, this is for government-owned homes, right? Foreclosures. This is, this is a very good website. You get some good deals on here. HUDHomes.com. HUDHomes.com. This is Bid Select. Now, our first home, the first property we got in the country in 2009, 2010, we've actually found that property on this website. We found it on this website. Again, it's a, it's a government-owned foreclosure website. They don't seem as diverse now as they were then. There have been some changes, but I would still check them out. And it's a very interesting situation. You don't talk to a human being. The real, your realtor actually has to bid for you electronically on, on the Internet, on the website. And he never talks to a person either. Everything is done through the Internet. And you bid and you wait and you find out and you wait and you bid and you win. And we won. But God did it. Amen? Amen. So bid select's a good one. Homepath.com. It's another good one. Homepath. Foreclosed homes. Foreclosures. Homepath.com. We're going shopping. Amen. With God's help. Amen. Mother Earth News. Great magazine. It was a magazine for many years since the 70s. Now they have a great website that has, includes all type of things. Building, cooking, planning, everything. But they also sell land and property. They also sell land and property. So there's their, the portion of their website where they have houses for sale, country land for sale. Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, Texas, Tennessee, Montana, Arkansas, Texas. Amen, amen. So Mother, MotherEarthNews.com. Realty Track, another foreclosure website, Realty Track with a C, T R A C, dot com. There's another one people use, very popular. Very, very popular. United Country, all they sell. It's country property. That's it. United Country Real Estate. 
Country Living Resources. Now, this website here is exclusively set up for Seven Day Adventists. Seven Day Adventists sell homes on this website, and they, they market or promote their website to other Seven Day Adventists. So every home you see on here will be for sale by a Seven Day Adventist Christian. Very, yeah, very, very reliable resource. <clears throat> Not a whole lot of property, but they do have property. Amen. This is a website, if you don't have it, or a feature or an app on your computer, you have to get this. This is Google Earth. Google Earth. You have to have this. What this gives you a chance to do is to be able to zoom in anywhere, basically on the planet, not just America, but anywhere, and you can get a, an overhead sa satellite shot of the property you're interested in purchasing or looking at. So it gives you a nice view or proximity of where your house is located compared to the neighbors and the topography on the land, etc. So what you do is type in an address, and then what it happens is, it'd be, I should have done this in real time, but <clears throat> in the interest of time, you type in an address and it starts to zoom in. Now, I believe the address I typed in for this one, for example, was a church that my wife and I spoke at last year in Northern California in the town of Salinas, the Salinas Seventh-day Adventist Church. So we zoom in, there's Salinas, that's the address. You zoom in a little closer, you start to see the outline of the town. It's kind of a farming community, so you see all that as, as well, amen. You see the mountains over here, so everything becomes crystal clear, right? A little closer, now you're really zooming in. You see all the layout of the streets and the neighborhoods, and there's the church right there in the middle. And then there's the church right there. That's the church, and this is the fellowship hall. And this is the parking lot and other buildings. And that's the street level. Many times you can get a street level of the property you're trying to buy or trying to see. A lot of times in the country, you may not have access to a street level because the house is so remote. But in this situation, usually there's an option to have an opportunity to see a close-up of the street of the property. This is another one. This is the Central Filipino uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church in Los Angeles. Brother Mason spoke in there before. I spoke there a few times. And they had a street view as well. So there's, you see the freeway right next to it. That's the, uh, the, the uh, 210 freeway. This is Colorado Boulevard. And that's the church, Central Filipino. Very big church, by the way. But that's a feature, feature that this, uh, this website does. So I'm going to skip this. That's, again, the same thing, Google Earth on the property we owned five years ago. And that's the street view. And again, this is a country house now, and it gives you a street view. So in, in other words, you have an option to get the street view when it's available, when it's available. This, if you're taking notes, please write this down. This is citydata.com, city-data.com. This is a must resource. You have to use this. It's a must. It gives you just about every categorical piece of information you can get on a town or a zip code area. Very, very, very important to have. Very helpful. Citydata.com. I picked a random town, Sandpoint, Idaho. Sandpoint, Idaho. It's in northern Idaho. I type that in. It gives you usually a few pictures that some of the residents have sent in. I'm just scrolling down. Then it gives you a little map. It gives you the population, the demographic breakdown, male, female, the median age, the income level, et cetera, et cetera. And it gives you an outline of the town. Again, skipping down some more, it gives you the demographic breakdown, if that's important to you. Continues to get more information, the ancestries of the residents there, the local time, the elevation, 2,085 feet. That's not bad, right? That's not bad. The land area, 3.99 miles. The population density, 1,896 people per square mile. That's considered low. That's considered low. Just going to give you a little more information about this website. There it gives you in relation to that corner of the country. That's where it's located, the red dot. That's a skylight view or, or a satellite view. It gives you the age, the high school graduates, college graduates, the nearest towns of 50,000 or more how many miles away it is. So the nearest town, 50,000 people or more, is Spokane, Washington. The population is actually 195,000. 
57 miles. That's a little close. That's a little close, I would say. The nearest city of 200,000 plus is East Seattle, 263 uh, miles away. That's good. That's very good. And of course, Seattle has 480,000 people. Nearest city with 1 million people plus, of course, is LA, and it's 985 miles away. <clears throat> south. It even gives you the direction. LA is south of Idaho, of, uh, spoke of uh, Sandpoint, Idaho. It's south. 36, 3 million people. So all the small towns that are close by, it gives all that. The average cost of the buildings and the homes. It gives graph number of permits, uh, average cost of the homes, household income, household values. We talked about the crime rate index last night. The crime rate index there is pretty low, 221. Average temperatures, the climate per year, precipitation, humidity, wind speed, snowfall, sunshine. It really breaks it down. It really does. I love this website. Earthquake activity, natural disasters, causes of natural disasters. Talks about businesses there, banks, hospitals in the area, colleges and universities. We're not going to get into that. High schools, elementary, libraries, cemeteries, different parks, tourist attractions, hotels, air pollution, air quality, all these things. Very, very comprehensive. Banks again, fire safe hotels in the area, travel time to work. Most commonly use house heating fuels, Adhe uh, the, the, the um, religious adherents. See the pie here, Catholic, Evangelical, Latter-day Saints, Seventh-day Adventist, praise the Lord. 9%, 9%, not bad. So number of super centers, I'm sure that's Walmart, right? Convenience stores, convenience stores, full-service restaurants. Adult diabetic rate, adult obesity, it's just very, very comprehensive again. It's very, very comprehensive. So we talked about this last night. And we talked about how we had to, we used this, these websites to find out what we needed to know about Tennessee. Once we felt like the Lord was leading us to Tennessee, we used all this information to basically decide where in the state we wanted to live. So these websites give a lot of information. I love citydata.com. We talked about all this last night. And we decided to move in the area where we'd be furthest away from. But I didn't touch on this last night, actually. We determined that where we moved to, which was right around here, right between Nashville and Memphis, was ironically enough, it was exactly 120 miles away each direction. So Nashville was 120, 120 miles away and Memphis was 120 miles away. They were both about the same distance. So we would get on the local highway, we'd come down to Interstate 40, or we'd go out this way. So it wasn't too far to go shopping and go to Costco and different places. It took about maybe two hours or so. And a lot of times in the country, of course, you have what they call country miles. And again, I'm explaining this, I'm breaking this down for the, the person who doesn't know about country living, the novice. When you have a country setting, you're going to be stuck on certain roads that are going to have you driving a little slower than the main road. So a place that might take you usually 90 minutes to get to may take you two hours because some stretches may have you driving 20 miles an hour or 25 miles or maybe even 10 miles an hour. Or you might get stuck behind a tractor or a bush hog, right? That happens too. That was an eye-opening experience for us. It was a, it was a culture shock, actually. But, but God is good. Praise the Lord. So I want to repeat these from last night. I think we may have some new viewers and it bears repeating. Out of the cities is my message at this time. Be assured that the call is for our people to locate how far? Miles away from the large cities. Some people believe a gas tank away. Some people say 100 miles. Some people say 50, depending on how big that city is that is 50 miles away. Some people say, well, 75. Some people don't want to be even in the same state as a big city. So again, it's, it all depends on where the Lord leads you. Your experience is between you and the Lord. The Bridges family is not a template for anybody. But we're going to talk about the template that we have in a few minutes. Now, part of that template is what we discussed in the opening. All the scriptures we went through with all the promises, also from the spirit of prophecy. All those promises are the templates we use for God to open the door for us. And he can do it for you, for you too. Amen. He wants you or us to live where we can have elbow room so we can't be too close to our neighbors. We have to stress and overemphasize that. 
We have to have space so we can be free from interference from who will at some point become our enemies and our bitterest enemies. In fact, I'll read that here. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Repeatedly, God says, get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded together or closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. I got an email today from somebody who watched last night and they asked, they had mentioned that their mom was wondering or questioning about why can't we have, I want to be in the country, but I want neighbors. The answer is right here. We can't be crowded together, so we'll be free from the interference of enemies. If they don't believe in what we believe, they're enemies. They're enemies. And they're going to really be enemies at the passing of the what? The National Sunday Law. Yes, unless God changes their hearts. Amen. We are not to locate ourselves where we will be forced into close relations with those who do not honor God. That's very important, too. A crisis is soon to come in regard to the observance of Sunday. Sunday is coming. So this is a situation with data, citydata.com. This is the zip code for the town that we were living in a few years ago. Sometimes on this website, and again, I can't, I can't say this enough. You have to use this website. But many times the town is so small, it won't show up on this website. So what you do is type in the zip code. It has every zip code. So this is the zip code for that town we were in, 38348. And it'll give the same information, sometimes even more for the zip code, but not the town. And again, Lavinia, population density, only 21 people per square mile. We hardly saw anybody, of course, except our, our close neighbor. Hardly any cars, but we did see them from time to time. L.A., big difference, 8,224 people per square mile. So, what are we looking for when we're looking for a home? I'm not going to steal the thunder of the Franklin family. They're going to give a very nice presentation to us on Sabbath afternoon, living off the grid. I'm just touching on these three points. These are important. We have to consider these when looking for and asking God to give us or entrust us with a country property. Three great pillars of country living. A water source, number one. A heat source, that's of course wood, number two. And a food source, a place to be able to grow food. So water source being, of course, a well or a spring head or year-round spring or a stream or whatever you may have on that property is essential. You may want to start off with county or city water in the beginning, but at some point you have to have your own source because we know from inspiration every earthly support is going to be what? It's going to be cut off. So we have to be able to not to depend on man. We have to have our own resource independent of man. Sustainable preparedness, in other words. And that reminds me, I'm going to promote a book before we close. I'm going to talk about that at the end, at the end. Heat source, have to have wood. The basic understanding is that you need to have five acres or more of wood, five acres to sustain a family for a few years. You got to have wood, got to have trees. You have to have trees. Do not buy a piece of land with no trees on it. You'll pay. You must have some trees. Amen. And again, we have to have somewhere to plant food because we know, again, all we're going to have to eat are our own provisions. That's why we're told that we have to we have to buy land that gives us an opportunity to do that, to, to, to grow our own food. Amen. Amen. So. This is. The possibility. This is what God wants to give you. If we're faithful. I'm going to repeat. We're nobody special. God put us in the country by a miracle. And he can do it for you too. We just have to have faith in his promises. The noble man wanted to see the fulfillment of his prayer before he should believe. Hmm. But he had to accept the word of Jesus that his request was heard and the blessing granted. This lesson we also have to learn. Not because we see or feel that God hears us are we to believe. We are to trust in his promises. Do we trust? Do we trust? When we come to him in faith, and we know we read earlier, faith pleases him. Without that, we can't please the Lord. Every petition enters the heart of God. When we have asked for his blessing, we should believe that we receive it. Believe it when we ask for it and thank him that we have received it. 
Do you see the principle there? That's faith. Then we are to go about our duties, assured that the blessing will be realized when we need it most. So you pray to God, ask him for the blessing, and you go about your day. I know you're going to answer it. You're not going to answer it the way I think you're going to answer it, but you're going to answer it. That's faith. That's faith. When we have learned to do this, we shall know that our prayers are answered. Hmm. Did you get that lesson? God will do for us exceeding abundantly according to the riches of his glory and the working of his mighty power. So, I'm going to read a quote that we read over and over and over again. A beautiful quote from the Spirit of Prophecy in the Desire of Ages. Page 668, paragraph 1. It is a wonderful quote. We stuck by it. We stood by it in faith and God blessed. Are you ready to read it? And we're going to go point by point. It's very important. In fact, why don't we pray before we read? Because I want to make sure we, we really, the viewers really, really, really get this. Really get this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your love and for sending Jesus to die on our behalf. The death that we surely desire or deserve to die. He loves us so much and we do not even nearly appreciate the love he has for us. Thank you, Father, from the bottom of our hearts over and over again. I pray, Lord, as we read these words from your heavenly throne room that you gave to your prophet, inspire her to write these words, Lord, that they would sink deep into our hearts and into our souls, that we truly grasp the, the pure understanding of them, the nature of them, what they mean, and how deep they are. And that we can apply them, Lord, to our lives and that we can claim the promise con contained therein and that we can receive a great blessing from heaven if we only have faith and listen and believe in thee. We have too much faith in mankind. Help us, Father, to overcome our unbelief. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Desire of Ages, 668, paragraph 1. Here we go. The Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. Do you want to disappoint Jesus? I don't. I don't. He desires his chosen heritage, that's us, to value themselves according to the price he has placed upon them. Hmm. So we have value based on the price he placed upon us. The price of his son, Jesus. God wanted them, that's all of us, else he would not have sent his son on such an expensive errand to redeem them, to buy us back, to buy us back. He has a use for them. And he is what? Well pleased when they make the very highest demands upon him, that they may glorify his name. Now, are we talking about a $5 million, 5,000 square foot house on Staten Island? No, not at all. According to his will, they may expect large things if they have faith in his promises. So, number one, he has a use for us. So when he puts us in the country, there's something for us to do there. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put us there in the first place. Well, the first point is that Jesus came to die for us, which means he has a use for us. That's the point. He has a use for us. He is well pleased when we make the highest, the very highest demands, she says, upon him. The very highest. So we know Hebrews 11 says that through faith, only through faith, we can please him. But he's well pleased when we make the very highest demands through faith that he will come through. And glorify his name by doing so. We may expect large things if we have the faith in his promises. It's a beautiful equation. But first we have to come to him in faith and ask. And believe that he's going to do it. And then, going back to all the promises we claimed in the early part of our lesson, we have to eliminate and overcome sin. We have to, we have to gain the victory. We have to gain the victory. Amen? Let's go to Second Peter before we close. Second Peter. Second Peter, verse one, chapter one. 
and verse 1. Book of 2 Peter. Second Peter, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us, precious what? Precious faith, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Key verse here, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Again, doing what? Having faith in his not only promises, the Bible says precious promises. That by these ye may be partakers or might be partakers of the divine nature, Jesus Christ. Having escaped the corruption of that is in the world through lust. Brother, sister, we can do it. We can do it, but only through faith in Jesus. We have to tap into that power source. Tap in. He left. He left us the comforter. He says, ask for him, and he will be there for us. Are you asking tonight? He wants us in the country, but we have to have the faith that he will take us there, and he will do it. We're an example. We have testimonies coming up this coming Sabbath. We know they're going to encourage the brethren greatly. They're going to light a fire under you. And hearing somebody else's experience always helps to encourage the brethren. Let's go to one more scripture before we close. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, Brother Paul repeatedly, repeatedly gave his testimony about how Jesus delivered him. Over and over again. Because he knew that your personal testimony gets people excited about the Lord, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Regarding the testimonies we're going to give on Sabbath. Verse 18 is the only verse I'm going to read. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege and opportunity of studying your word in a free society. We thank you so much, Lord, for the information that you provided for your people. We pray, Lord, that someone was affected, that someone was blessed, that someone learned something they didn't know before. Lord, we could be doing this me- these meetings for another two weeks. I just pray that you would help us to, to be able to pack and condense as much information as, as, information as we can during the next four meetings. It's been a blessing for all of us, Lord, and we just yearn to be in heaven with you forever. But there's so many things we have to do before that. We have to pass through so many things. We believe, Lord, that the final component in perfecting our characters is being out in nature with thee. Please, Lord, those families that are willing and want to put all on the altar to be able to move, to be able to leave the wicked cities they're in, I'm praying that you would hear their prayer, Lord that you would woo them, that you would compel them, Lord, to do what they need to do, to have you do what you need to do. It's all about faith. We just read it in your testimony, in your word. It's faith. Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please you. We want to please you. Help us all to be more faithful, Lord, much more faithful in everything that we do, say, think, and speak. Give us blessings from heaven, Lord, continually. Grant travel mercies to all those that are traveling tonight. Bless us, Lord, as we come back tomorrow evening to continue this series as we move into the practical part of it. We thank you, Father. We love you so much for dying in our place. We can't wait for you to come and take us home. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I know that you have been blessed this evening. I have been tremendously blessed. And it's obvious that we are going to need to exercise faith. And we're actually going to have a prayer of faith on your behalf this evening. Um, 
We want you to prepare your heart and we're going to seek the Lord in prayer this evening that God will help you to have that faith that's necessary for this time in which we live. I want to read from you to you from Luke, the 18th chapter. But before I do that, um, I do want to say to those that are local or if you plan to be here on Sabbath evening, there will be a we will have lunch here. You will need to bring food, though, for that lunch. So we call it potluck in the Adventist community. So we will be meeting here at four o'clock, maybe a little actually before or probably about one o'clock, one thirty. Um, but the meeting will actually start at four. So we just want you, if you are interested in being here, to, that you will bring food to put into the till. Now, uh, I've already been looking at some of the questions that's been coming in tonight, and some of those questions was actually answered tonight. There's a few questions that came in tonight, uh, and Brother Bridges already answered those questions. But we will still uh, uh, use those on Sabbath evening as well. Quite a few questions are coming in, and that's just wonderful that you are, your mind is being pricked. Now, we want to read from Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Well, to always pray and not to faint. Saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But after what he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man. Verse 5, very key. Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. This unjust judge said, This woman is worried me. I'm going to do something for her to get her off my case. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. The unjust judge said, listen, I'm going to avenge this woman. What's the, what's the, what's the message here? God wants us to press him. Press him. Press him. The more we press him, the more he enjoys it. He wants us to press him because he wants to answer our prayers. Verse 7 says, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Don't stop praying, brothers and sisters. And we've already given the, the biblical principle, biblical mandate that we need to be praying evening, morning, and at noon, and then will he hear us. Verse 8. I hope you have your Bibles open now. Verse 8 says, I tell you, that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth. Saints, it's time to exercise some faith. I'm going to ask Brother Bridges if you'll come back, and we're going to get right here in front of the podium, he and I, and those that are here together with us here at the studio. We want to get on our knees right now, and we want to petition the Lord that he will answer prayers. You need to be on your knees as well. And we need to clean our hearts out so that God can really hear our prayers this evening. This is this is time to exercise this faith thing. So we're going to get on our knees right now. And we are both going to offer up a prayer. I'm going to start and Brother Bridges, if he will close. Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, again, we are so thankful, we are so joyful to be able to come to the King, the creator of the entire universe. Oh, Lord, and recognize, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, down to this little speck of dust called the earth to redeem us. Lord, we are so thankful. We are so grateful. And Lord, we even feel your presence right now. Lord, as we have said in lesson tonight, those here and those that are all around the world that are viewing. We're asking you, Lord, this evening that you will help each and every one of us to exercise that faith now, faith that will move the hand of the creator of the universe. Lord, we're at such a time, we're at the very end, 
and the things that we have failed to do in times of prosperity, we now have to do under the most forbidden and discouraging circumstances. But Lord, we thank you for the counsel. If we will come to you even now, Lord, you will move. So Lord, help us this evening to begin to exercise that faith, to begin to pray and to study and to agonize. And as, as we look at the Bible, we see so many acts of faith there. We see Moses, Lord, as he raised up that rod. We see Joshua as he stepped in the water. Lord, and so many, many examples of faith. And that's so as I, even tonight, as I just listen, that's this miracle after miracle have been worked, Lord, to get people into the country. There's just so many miracles have been worked that I'm, I'm, that I'm personally aware of. And Lord, I know that you are ready to work some more miracles. And so, Lord, we ask you this evening, help those, help us all to exercise this faith that is necessary at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Heavenly Father, your Bible tells us that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that you change not. We believe, Lord, through faith that you are the same God that delivered the Israelites out of the hands of the Egyptians. Yes, Lord. That opened the Red Sea, that opened the Jordan, that delivered from so many different scenarios, and you fought battles and wars against other heathen nations, Lord, time and time again. Your people forsook you. They turned their backs against you. They worshiped heathen gods and pagan gods, Lord, and had idols and all these things, Father. At some point, you even asked them, you asked, what have I done? Testify against me. Testify against me. Show me proof that I've done thee wrong. Father, we don't want to be in that position. We're told that we have to learn the lessons of our forefathers, that all of these things are written for examples for us. Everything that happened in the Old Testament, in the Bible, overall, Please help us, Lord. Give us a deeper faith and belief in Thee. Help us to be able to believe in the unseen, the untouchable. Help us, Father. Yes, Lord. Not to depend so much on mankind. We put so much faith in man each and every day of our lives. Father, we need a faith and an experience we don't have right now. We're yes, told Lord. in Great Controversy yes. 622 that we're too indolent to obtain this experience, but we need it. So please, Lord, please teach us your will and your way. We know thy way is in the sanctuary. Yes, Lord. Everything we need is in there. That is the foundation. Help us, Lord. You move from place to place because you had a work to do. You move from the heavenly courts, condescended to here. You were born in Bethlehem of a virgin. You ascended to heaven after your crucifixion. You moved to the holy place. For 1,807 years, then you moved to the most holy place, Lord, 107 years ago. You moved because there was a work for you to do each place you went to. Yes. We know now, Lord, through faith that we have to move, but we can't move alone. Yes, Please, Father, all those families, and like Brother Mason said, I've heard stories of families even now that are being moved continually. Miracles are being wrought yes. on a daily, weekly basis. So everybody is a candidate to leave the city. Yes, Please, yes. Lord. Yes, yes. Hear their cry, hear their prayer, hear our prayer. Please begin to move on their behalf, Lord. We beg thee. We beg. We know you hear us, Lord. We know you'll answer. We know these prayers are like sweet incense ascending yes, to heaven, even right now, according to Revelation chapter 8. But, Lord, we, we, we just need you to move. Yes. The time is at hand, and we need to be moving in a haste. Please help us all, Lord, to be where we need to be to have Jesus' character to be able to go through the trouble without a mediator so we can go home and live with thee forever. Father, this is our prayer, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. May the words of our, of our mouth, mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.